In today's video, I'm going to show you how to take your videos from looking like this to this. Let's dive into it. Now, before we get too deep into this, I kind of do want to provide a quick disclaimer, and that is just simply that there is a lot more nuance and kind of artistic vision involved with this process than I'm going to cover in this video. Obviously, some of getting that cinematic image does have to do with simply doing this every day and kind of being in this field for years and just developing an eye for it. Now, that being said, I do still absolutely think that there is just a small handful of things that you can do and kind of check off the list in order to get a pretty pleasing image like this one, if I'm gonna hype myself up a little bit right now. Mainly when it's all said and done, in order to fast track this process, I think that you really just need to be on top of three things. Those being audio, lighting, and your camera settings. So let's go ahead and level up our audio. When it comes to getting a nice professional clean end product for your video, audio is something that is honestly huge and it's something that goes really overlooked a lot of the time. I definitely used to be one of the ones that overlooked audio because it's really just not something that's fun to me. It's not my area of expertise. It's not something I care about a lot, but as I progressed in my video career, I quickly realized that it was a huge piece of the puzzle and luckily there are a couple of tools that really make this easy and simple for us. There's a handful of ways you can go about getting quality audio and it's definitely a slippery slope if you dive into it too much. So I'm really gonna keep it simple and surface level here with the two main ways I think are best just to get up and moving. And those are on-camera microphones and lavalier microphones. On-camera microphones are exactly what the name is. They're microphones that are just mounted onto the camera. Stuff like this guy right here, the Rode Video Micro, one of my favorite just plug and play microphones that gives you excellent sound. The one catch with on-camera mics is that you want to be pretty close to your filming setup. So I'm about three feet away from the camera right now. And honestly, that's a bit too far in my opinion for on-camera mics, which is why I went for the lab with this one. But if you're doing something like a vlog or if you have a wider lens and you're much closer to the camera within I'd say one to two feet, then an on-camera mic is definitely the way to go. I will say this also, even if you are a bit farther from the camera than you'd like to be for a setup like this, this is still going to sound head and shoulders better than your in-camera mic. So if this is all you can afford or all you have laying around right now, definitely plug it in and it will easily be an upgrade to the in-camera mics. Those are just kind of a big no-no period. Good first step to take. So for option number two, which actually probably should be option number one, we have the lav. And for this, I'm using the DJI mic. I like labs a lot because they're omnidirectional. They're gonna capture pretty much anything in the vicinity that they're in. And there are pros and cons to that, but when it comes to clipping it to your collar, you can almost pretty much guarantee you're going to get great noise from a person's voice in the immediate area, obviously. I also really enjoy the extra freedom that you have with a lab. You know, I can kind of walk around the frame, I can turn to the side, I can turn around, and you'll still hear my voice just fine, as opposed to with a directional shotgun style on-camera mic like I just showed you, the voice completely goes away. If you turn or anything like that, your audio is gonna be going in a different direction and that directional mic will not be picking it up. So when I have the lav right here being omnidirectional, it's gonna pick my voice up no matter where I'm at. Obviously the location of these mics is important, but like I said, they are very flexible. So nine times out of 10, you're just gonna to wanna to clip it to your collar or whoever your talent is. And if not, you know, if somebody's wearing a button up or something, you can kind of slide the clip in between two of the buttons or something like that. You know, there's plenty of videos out there that can show you mounting solutions, but overall, I think that clipping it to the collar is a surefire way to get really quality audio fast. Again, I am using the DJI mic for this, and I really like these because it is a good, just wireless set of mics that allows me to plug it in, and I don't have to worry about syncing audio in post or anything like that. Very plug and play, very simple, kind of once you get the overall feel of it. There's lots of tutorial videos online and stuff like that. So something like this, I highly recommend, but it could be overkill for you depending on what your budget is and what your mission is. When you get something like the DJI mic or the Rode Wireless Go kit, it really just kind of adds rocket fuel to your workflow. And I'm not gonna lie to you, I told you I wasn't much of an audio guy. So 99% of the time in the field when I'm doing corporate work or events or interviews or anything like that, Rather than set up a big boom kit or something like that, I'm just going to mic someone on their collar and lav it all. And it really just gives me great results every time. I just don't see a reason to really change it. So this is a great way to go. If you didn't want to mess with wireless, then I do highly recommend the Tascam DR10L. The Tascam is definitely a beast in its own right. I used it pretty much exclusively before upgrading to the DJI mic because I wanted the wireless capability. 
but if you don't mind syncing in post, it really is just as nice. The audio is just as good. You don't have as many options with it, but for what it is, it packs a lot of punch and it really is just kind of a one-stop solution for your audio. So now that we have audio down pretty well, let's move on to the next piece of the puzzle, which is gonna be lighting. So now that we're ready to talk lighting, I've kind of created a clean slate for us. I've turned off all my video lights, I've turned off all of my practicals, and I've just left us with what I have available, which is my kitchen light, my foyer light, and my living room light back there. And they're all coming together to create this, whatever is really going on here. It's not very cinematic. Now, depending on what your skill level is, what your use case is, who you are, etc., you may be looking at this image and be thinking to yourself, why do I need lights? This looks pretty decent. This is a pretty dim location. So I've got the exposure up as high as it'll go at this point, and I'm getting a pretty decently usable image. Now the average camera is not the a7S III, does not have usable ISO at 12,800. So just keep that in mind when you're putting together your setup. Luckily, there is a super easy and affordable way to level up your image tenfold, and that is with a key light. So here's the massive difference that one light can truly make. This is the only light that we've added so far, and you can see that it has already given our image a huge facelift. If you were to ignore every other part of this lighting section, do not ignore this part. Get yourself a key light. If it is the only light that you have in your kit to start off with, it is totally fine. It's going to give you very usable images every time. Key lights are very powerful and they kick out a lot of light, so it's ideal for lighting a subject with. You typically wanna put one on a stand kind of above your head. Mine's kind of sitting right here and you want it angled at about 45 degrees. So it's kind of hitting my face right here. You can definitely put the light front and center. You can put it wherever you want, but typically for the most cinematic kind of pleasing result, you do want it at that 45 degree angle. The specific key light that I'm using is one that I have spoken at length about on this channel in various videos. So if you're familiar with my content, you've definitely heard of it. And that is the Godox SL60W. You can find this thing in a kit on eBay with like a softbox, a stand and everything else ready to go for like 130, 150 bucks. And you can buy just the light on its own anywhere from like 99 bucks on Black Friday to like 120, 130 and other places, just depending on where you wanna buy it. But I will say this is one of the most important purchases that I've made in my career. It is easily what makes your picture look the best right off the bat. Lighting is one of those things that can make any camera pretty much look decent and usable given the circumstances. And a key light is just a good way to get a lot of light onto your subject to eliminate any noise or any artifacting or anything like that that can make the image look off. As with everything else, you do have a ton of options when it comes to key lights. So the Godox SL60W is a great beginner option and I'm well into my video career at this point. I do this full time and I still find this to be a very reliable light if you treat it well, but you do have stuff on the more pro end like the Aperture 120D Mark II. And then you've also got several other companies like Small Rig making quality lights at this point. You've also got the Aperture Amaran line that I've been looking to check out, but really any of them are going to be good if they're coming from a reputable brand. You can pretty much always count on the fact that they're going to enhance your image pretty heavily. And really quick before moving on to the other lights in our setup, it's very important that we understand diffusion and why it's important. All diffusion is, is a way to soften the light that's hitting your subject. So I've got some pretty nice roll off right here. The shadows are not harsh, they're nice and soft. The lighting isn't super hot. It's not very white on my face. It's very pleasing. And that is because I've got a material in front of the light that's doing that. And again, if you're familiar with my channel, you know that I take a very no-nonsense approach to this, and that is just a white umbrella. I find that it does pretty much 90% of the job that a traditional large softbox does, and it's just way cheaper, way more compact, and easy to set up and collapse quickly. An umbrella is gonna do just fine. You can buy one or two of these on Amazon for like 20 bucks, and it really is just the simplest way to get great soft light without having to set up a soft box and collapse it when you're done or worry about storing it or something like that. Really simple, easy way is just to throw a white umbrella on there and call it a day. Granted, you're not superstitious about opening an umbrella indoors. In that case, deal with the soft box. I'll show you real quick what this looks like without diffusion, just to hammer the point home. So that is why diffusion matters. So now that we've covered the main meat and potatoes with our large key light, here comes what I think is the more fun part, which is building out the scene, making sure it looks good, making sure it looks natural, nice and saucy, or as the kids like to say, cinematic. 
We're first going to start by turning every other light that isn't a video light off. So I'm gonna turn the kitchen, the living room, and the foyer lights off. So here we are with all of the lights turned off except for our key light right here. And again, depending on your use case, this could be a stopping point. If you were doing something really documentary, really dramatic, that needed that harsh kind of Godfather style lighting, this could be an end point. Not super ideal for certain things like maybe a YouTube video, but it definitely doesn't look bad. And again, depending on what your use case is, you could stop here. But let's move on to the next part of this specific scene, and that is going to be lighting my practicals. And when I say practical lighting, all I mean is lights that already exist within the scene. So these are not video specific lights. These are things like lamps, night lights, TVs even, or overhead lights, anything of that sort that would already be in the scene anyway. So I'm gonna start with lighting two lights that are on both sides of my image just to give it a nice balanced feel. There's a salt lamp right there that we're gonna light, and then there is a floor lamp back there that we're gonna turn on. So let's see what it looks like with just those two. Hey, turn on the floor lamp. So here we are with our practicals turned on, and this is already a pretty big facelift, but I think that we could do a little bit more, and that's what I'm gonna call motivating the practical lights. So when I say we're gonna motivate our practical lights, all that means is we're gonna put more light into the scene that kind of looks like it could be created by those practicals. So I'm gonna fill this back area right here with more light, and it's gonna kind of look like it's coming from that salt lamp and floor lamp combined to provide a more ambient glow, kind of fill the space a little bit more. We just want something that's overall more balanced and has a bit more personality and character to it. To accomplish this, I'm going to keep it really simple with a single LED panel light, specifically the newer 660 Pro RGB. So here we are with our final image and similar to audio, I am no expert when it comes to lighting, so don't look at me as one, but I think that what we have here is a pretty well-rounded, nice image to look at. I've got my LED panel right here and it's just shooting at the interior of the room right here. And what I really like about the newer 660 Pros is that they have barn doors on them. And barn doors are just those metal flaps that are around a light that kind of allow you to shape it and tell it where to go. I've got the barn doors pretty much wide open on this, except for the fact that's right next to me, I've got the right barn door tipped inward so that the light doesn't spill onto my face. I'll show you what it looks like if I take that barn door outwards. And this doesn't look too bad, but it does cast a little bit of extra light on the side of my face. And again, the whole goal with adding this light in general is to make it look like those two lights are creating it and kind of filling this room with natural ambient light. So with it hitting the side of my face like this, it doesn't really look like that lamp back there would be capable of doing that. So I'm gonna flip the barn door back in and keep that light aimed directly at the interior of the room where I want it. So just a quick recap, here's what the image looks like with no lighting except the lights that we have available to us in the ceiling. And now here's our image with just a key light added. This is the Godox SL60W with a nice white umbrella for diffusion. And again, if you have no other lights, no practicals to play with, no nothing, this is a pretty good point to land on if you're early in your journey. Here we are with all of our lights turned off now except for the key light. Again, this is a nice little dramatic moment if you're looking for that, but let's move on to turning on our practicals. And now here we are with our practicals. This is an area that you can have a little bit more fun and kind of spice up a little bit depending on what your personality type is. If you've got some cool neon you can hang up or something, this is definitely the time to do it. And depending on how your image looks, you may or may not want to move to the next step, which is motivating our practicals with a little bit more light to fill the space. And now here we are once again with our nice final image. We've got the newer 660 Pro LED panel shooting into the room. I've got it at about 3200 Kelvin to kind of match these two lights back here, my practicals. And this just helps to look a bit more natural. It looks like these lights are creating a bit more light behind me and kind of adding a bit more of an ambient fill just to give an overall more pleasing end result. So I don't know about you guys, but I'm pretty psyched with how the image is looking right now. I'm pretty psyched with how things are sounding right now. Overall, the vibes are just immaculate. But it is still super important to understand how all of this is tied together in the camera and how some of our camera settings can influence our final image. I'll start by saying shoot at whatever f-stop that you want. I know that you tend to hear that shallow depth of field is like the ultimate in cinematic imagery. And while I definitely think that, you know, images with a shallower depth of field tend to look a bit more pleasing for stuff like this, it's not the end-all be-all. You know, there's plenty of blockbusters that didn't use super shallow depth of field. So don't get too hung up on that. Here on the YouTubes, it's kind of a sensitive subject among some 
I'm shooting at 2.8 right now just because I think that is the most pleasing for what I'm doing, but don't feel like you have to. Work with what you've got if you don't have a lens that stops down that low. Just use what you have. I promise that the lighting and audio and everything else will make up for any lack of depth of field. Next, we'll quickly cover focal length. And this is debatable depending on who you ask, but I will say generally anywhere between like 35 to 85 is probably the most pleasing for human subjects at least. With wide focal lengths like 15, 20, 24, stuff like that, it can kind of make us look narrow and it'll get worse the closer you are to the camera. So if you're doing like a vlog type setup, obviously things are a bit more wide. It's why some things tend to look a bit more stretched out. When you have a bit more room to play with like this, anywhere from that 35 to 85 range is generally considered to be the most natural and similar to what our eye is going to see. And having a little bit of compression is nice. I'm shooting this video at about 50 millimeters right now on full frame. So I think that's kind of a no nonsense, super simple focal length to stick to for certain things like this. But again, there's no hard and fast rules. That's the best part about all of this. We're creating art and we're having fun. So shoot at whatever focal length you want and do with that advice what you will. This next setting note is one that I in particular take super seriously. I treat this like the gospel and I follow it pretty much with every video and that is the 180 shutter rule. And that is basically your frame rate and how your shutter speed talk to each other to create an image. So when we're talking about frame rates, 24 frames per second is generally what we want to be landing at when we're wanting to look the most cinematic and natural. 24 frames per second is what you're going to see in most movies and most TV. It's just what looks the best to most of us but you do have some exceptions like live news, some soap opera type stuff where they have that more fluid movement. That is where people are using 30 frames a second. You just get more frames and you get a bit more of a fluid movement, but you start to deviate from that cinematic look. You obviously have a lot of higher frame rates that you can play with as well, but for the sake of this video, we're gonna keep it simple. Stay at 24, I'm telling you. No matter what people say about 30 frames per second, about 60 frames per second, it does not look good. It does not look natural. 24 frames per second is it. But do what you want. I'm not your dad. In order to complete this look, we want to set our shutter speed accordingly. And all that we have to do here is set our shutter speed to double whatever our frame rate is. So we're shooting at 24 frames per second. Technically double of that is 48, but the closest shutter speed my camera has to that is 50. So we're just gonna set it to 50. And the reason we do this is because it gives you the most natural look and the most natural motion blur according to what our eye sees. So if I move my hands like this, you'll see that there is a bit of natural blur. And if you look at them with your eyes, you will see it is not a super crisp image. It's very kind of blurry, very organic looking. So if we turn the shutter speed up, it will look like this. Now we have our shutter speed set to 125, and as you can see, this just looks absolutely awful. Our motion is more choppy and frozen as opposed to that nice organic look with some blur attached to it. This right here is just paining me to even do. I don't like doing this. This is not good for my mental health. This is not good to be on my channel. I don't want to be remembered for this. So now we are back at the sweet spot of a 50th of a second shutter speed with a 24 frames per second frame rate all is well in the world. Again, it's all jokes, do whatever you want, but this is one that I stick hard and fast to. I do not like the look of mixing different higher shutter speeds with different frame rates and all that. I just think it is a super easy rule to follow that can give you really good looking footage. And you know, if you're in a super bright place, if you're vlogging or something, it's not as important, but for stuff like this where you want that nice image, I do think it's really important to adhere to this one, but rules do exist to be broken, so do with that what you will. The next big setting we're gonna look at is white balance. And this can truly change the entire tone and feel of your image. White balance is something else that I feel is super overlooked when it comes to creating really good looking video. And it's honestly super simple, so I don't really know why. So let's dive into how to do it correctly. It's important to understand that white balance is measured in Kelvin. And when we're shooting video, we typically stay between the range of like 2800 Kelvin on the bottom to like 5600 to 6000 Kelvin on the top. A quick rule of thumb is to understand the lower you go, the more blue your image is going to get. So down at 3200 Kelvin, we're going to have a super blue image. And then on the opposite end of that, as we go up the spectrum into that 5,000, 6,000 territory, our image will get a lot more warm and saturated. We obviously want to find a sweet spot. And if you don't really wanna worry about it too much, then you can set your camera to auto white balance. But if anything changes in your scene, if you're using any type of natural light and the sun is moving, then it can really start to cause some issues. 
your white balance can start bouncing all over the place. Things will look different at the beginning of the video and at the end of the video. And it's really best to just be able to control all of that in the camera and not worry about it changing mid video. The best thing that I can tell you with this is just to adjust it according to what your eye sees. So go to your manual white balance on your camera and just rotate the dial and play with things until your image is kind of looking like what you're seeing with your eyes. It's a pretty good rule of thumb that when you're shooting something like this with a big key light like this, you're going to be somewhere in that five to 5400 range. So this is a daylight balanced light. And what that means is the sun outside is generally regarded to be about 5600 Kelvin. It's nice and warm, nice and orange. So when we have a big light like this acting as kind of the sun, then we want to set it accordingly and set our white balance to somewhere in that 5,000 to 5,600 range. This particular image is about 5,200 Kelvin. I thought that 5,600 looked a bit too warm. I typically always start at 56 and kind of go down or up from there as needed in a case like this. And it still looks pretty warm. I tend to like a warm color grade. So please do understand that some of this is a stylistic choice as well. So you can play with it according to what you simply want your image to look like as well. If we turn all of our lights off and are left with just the warm ceiling lighting that we have, you'll see where white balancing becomes so important. So if you don't have a key light, especially, or any other lights to work with, white balance could be your best friend because it could make an otherwise crappy lighting situation look pretty decent. So I'm still shooting at about 5200 right now. Let's turn this way down. Like I said, if you go down the Kelvin scale into like the 4000s, 3000s, your image will start to cool down a lot. So we're looking really orange and yellow right now. Let's turn our Kelvin down and see what it does for our image. So here's our image now that we are properly white balanced. I have changed it all the way from 5200 down to 3200 in order to cool some of this warm lighting off. But this should definitely show you that white balance is definitely something you should not overlook. It's a very underrated tool in your toolbox when it comes to getting a pleasing image. And it's pretty cool that it can be used as a stylistic choice as well. In this simple scene right here with just my overhead lighting, we've turned it into something that is pretty crappy looking into something that is very usable if we had no other lights available. So here we are back in our nice cinematic looking scene and there's one more thing that I wanna go over that is pretty important when it comes to getting an image like this and that is shooting in a flat color profile if possible. Again, I'm shooting on the Sony a7S III right now and one of the best things about this camera is the 10-bit color that it offers and the S-Log3 that it offers and all the freedom that you have to color grade from that S-Log3. And honestly, if you're super early in your journey and have gotten enough out of this already, you can definitely skip this part. This is for those that may have a nicer camera that can take advantage of stuff like this or that care about kind of going that extra mile in order to achieve an image. They want a bit more control over their image in the color grade post-production process. And again, flat profiles really give you the most latitude to do something like that. The first image that you get out of camera looks something like this. And then you can either tweak it or throw a LUT on whatever your process is in order to get the most bang for your buck when it comes to color. That being said, most cameras these days have a decently pleasing image straight out of camera, so you don't have to worry about this one. But at this point in my journey specifically, I pretty much shoot absolutely everything in log or in a flat profile, as I said, unless it's something like a vlog or something that I feel like just doesn't require that extra time in the edit. If I can help it, I try to shoot in log a flat color profile so that I have a lot of freedom to play with the colors in the edit. And that definitely contributes to ending up with this specific image that you're seeing at least right now. So now we've covered it all. I know that that was a bit of a long haul. I appreciate you if you hung in for all of this. Definitely let me know if you appreciate the more educational stuff that I do like this. I really wanna help the community and give back to the community that has given me so much over the years. YouTube has really been such a cornerstone when it comes to my development as an artist and as a freelancer. You know, I've learned everything on YouTube. I've learned everything that I'm teaching you right now on YouTube. And other stuff obviously comes from field experience and just working in it every day. But you know, when it came to starting out, it was all YouTube. So I really like to make these types of videos to give back to that community and to help other people who may just be starting their journey with video or just trying to enhance and get a little better at what they're doing. So definitely let me know if you wanna see more like this. I really go through all the comments. I try my best to respond to everyone, kinda of take feedback into consideration and everything. So I appreciate you listening to my professional advice as best as I can give it. This is just kind of a general method that I think is good for plugging and playing and getting a nice image in the least amount of time possible with the least amount of resources. I really hope that you guys had some fun with this one and maybe picked up one or two things from it. I really appreciate you tuning in. As always, it really does mean the world to me. Always remember that you are blessed and you are loved.
And as always, I'll be back soon.